In this course, obviously as the name implies we are going to cover digital signal processing and, I will demonstrate to you some core concepts using the MATLAB, Mathematical Analysis Program. I will cover most of the basics, of digital signal processing here, including properties of digital signals, and sequences transforming between time and frequency domains, convolution, digital filters design, and software filter implementation. And in the next chapter, we will begin with a discussion of the preliminary mathematical topics of digital signal processing. In this section, I will begin to discuss some preliminary concepts, necessary to further a discussion of the topic of digital signal processing. First we need to define what exactly a digital signal is, as we know from analog electronics, a signal is a carrier of information. In reality, it is any sort of physical quantity upon which we bestow meaning. The most often in engineering we're talking about things like voltage or current, and the meaning that we associate with the signal varies based upon an application. A digital signal in contrast is one whose values are discrete numbers, as opposed to an analog signal, which has a value at any given infinitesimal point in time. Digital signals only have values that exist both at finite points in time and in magnitude. Digital signals need to be represented in a computer's memory, and because of this we only have a finite number of choices that we can assign to the amplitude of the signal, which is why digital signals' values are quantized. They also on the existed certain instances of time, or space, here as I have shown in the figure for you and it's due to these two factors why we can represent a digital signal as a sequence of numbers or as a discrete function that generates a sequence of numbers. So, now we have our definition of digital signal in hand, we need to discuss what exactly a system is. And for our purposes, a digital system is anything that can modify digital signals, which can be a physical system like a car stereo, a digital filter that we've designed a noise source within another system, or anything else that can modify our signal. A particular class of digital system and one which we are going to focus upon for the remainder of this course, is a linear shift invariant system, and this is the counterpart to a linear time invariant system in the analog or continuous time domain, which are normally represented by a linear constant coefficient differential equations, when we're in the continuous time domain, and here which we'll talk about in a minute or in video is in a linear system shift invariant systems we're going to be representing them by a linear constant coefficient difference equations. So, we mean by linear is that superposition applies that a linear system is both associate and commutative, and shift invariant simply means that the shape of the system output does not vary with the start point of the input. So, I've used the word sequence here a couple of times throughout our discussion. I feel that it's time to more properly define them, and discuss a few of the key properties that we'll be dealing with when it comes to sequences of numbers. The first one. Periodicity and there we have pretty much the standard definition of periodicity very similar to the one we've seen in continuous time signals and functions. And then, we also have a couple different versions of symmetry that can exist within a sequence. Obviously, we have even and odd. Which are exactly the same as their counterparts in the continuous time, where an even sequence is one whose values are mirrored from the left and right side of the origin or the y-axis. A sequence is odd if they are mirrored both over the y-axis and the x-axis there. And then we have two different kinds of symmetry, and I guess new kinds of symmetry, that we'd be talking about when we're talking about sequences of complex numbers, and that we have a conjugate symmetry which is basically even but also considering the conjugate, and conjugate anisymmetry which is almost the same as odd, except also considering the conjugate of the second sequence there. So, let's talk about a couple of fundamental sequences, and these are, sequ these are sequences upon which we will build our understanding of digital signals. Both of these have very familiar counterparts in the analog domain. The first we have here is the unit sample sequence, which is the digital equivalent of the Dirac delta function and it's very simply and only has one value, and that is a 1, at n equals 0, and 0 everywhere else. And then we have the unit step function, which is the digital equivalent of a heavy side step function where when n goes greater than 0, or it's 0, then we have the function equal to 1. Otherwise it's set to 0. Now the other thing that I should note here is that the unit sample and the unit step also shift just like in continuous time. So, if we had a minus 1 here instead of just n in this the spot here or this one would be moved 1 to the right. Just the same as we do in continuous time. 
OK also a few other definitions that we have for sequences stability and causality. A system is said to be stable. If the output is bounded for all bounded inputs and that's very very general very mathematical jargony way to describe it, and essentially what we mean is that a finite input will not give us an infinite output of the system, and causality simply means that the system can exist in real time meaning that the system does not need values from the future in order to compute its current output. That's what we mean by a causal system. To another, we've covered most of the basics via signals and sequences of numbers. Let's discuss here a couple of common ways that we're going to represent digital systems so that we can analyze them. The three common methods of representing a digital system here, and via difference equations block diagrams, and signal flow graphs and a difference equation is the digital counterpart to a differential equation which I told you earlier. And essentially we're representing the current output of the system as a combination of previous inputs and outputs. And when the output depends only on previous inputs, and not to the previous output the system is known to have a finite impulse response, and we'll talk about why, that is later. But it is an important categorization here, finite impulse response means there's no feedback in the system, and an infinite impulse response system or IIR means that there is feedback in the system, meaning that these B coefficients here in the difference equation are non-zero in an infinite impulse response system, whereas they are all zero in a finite impulse response system. Like I mentioned earlier, linear shift invariant systems can always be represented by a linear constant coefficient difference equation, and when a system's difference equation is known, the output can be determined for arbitrary input, using classic solution methods for difference equations such as method of undetermined coefficients. So, I'll give you a brief example, using the method of undetermined coefficients here, and how we would solve a constant coefficient difference equation here. So, here's our problem statement we have that yk equal to alpha times y minus 1 plus the input xk and I show here that the input is equal to b to the k for a k greater than 0. And we are looking for the output. So the first step. Obviously just like differential equations, we were looking for the homogeneous solution. So, we set the input equal to 0. We go ahead and find our characteristic equation, and we see that the root of the homogeneous solution is only going to be 1, because this is a first order is going to be alpha raised to the k so that, gives us our solution here, for the homogeneous solution. For a particular solution, we're going to use the method of undetermined coefficients, and assume that our particularly solution is of the same form as the input multiplied by a constant, and we'll plug this back into the difference equation to go, and find our coefficient here, which I've done. Finally, we'll combine all both of those solutions, the homogeneous and particularly here, and that gives us our solution here although we still have two arbitrary coefficients in the solution, and just as with differential equations, we would have to have initial conditions to the problem, in order to find out the value of those two coefficients. Our next method of representing a system, is going to be the block diagram block diagram to represent the flow of information in a system in a visual manner, and make it very easy for an engineer or designer, to get a grasp of what is going on, within the system. As you can see here, in the figure we have a couple of basic components within our block diagrams, we have a delay here, which we will see notated often as you do negative 1. I will talk about why, that is later on in the course you have a summation or a summer block and we have gains here, we're simply multiplying by a constant in the directions, the arrows of course, show how the input goes through. Maybe through this gain here into the summer, or is delayed by 1 and multiplied by again here, into a sum so essentially would have the input coming in here with again be 0. And then, we'd also have the last input being multiplied, and added by the gain b1 and the input from 2 steps ago would be multiplied by the gain b2 all being added up to head to the output along with previous versions of the output being added back here, in a feedback loop. In a very similar manner, to a block diagram, we have the signal flow graph, and signal flow graphs are do almost exactly the same thing, as a block diagram, although they have a little bit different. I guess visual syntax is a way to put it here again we have az to the negative 1, representing a delay, and we have b10, 
along these lines and those represent our gains, and every spot here along with signal flow graph is considered a summation node, other than that the signal flow graphs and block diagrams are almost identical. So, briefly let's summarize what we've discussed here, in the first chapter. We've discussed, what exactly is a digital signal, and what is a system. We talked about various properties of both of those, as well as some fundamental sequences, that will be used often in digital signal processing, and we've also covered the big three versions of system representation. We've talked about linear constant coefficient difference equations, we had an example on how to solve one given the input, how to find the output. We've also discussed briefly, what a block diagram is, and what is said no flow graph is. And in the next chapter we'll move along to really the core concepts of digital signal processing. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos at One Stop Engineering.